Thank you, Joe. That was really interesting stuff. That iceberg is absolutely terrifying. Okay, I think we're switching back now. So I want to take uh, take a moment to uh, talk about scale. Oh, here we go. Uh, so we're going to change key, shift gears a little bit from fidelity now to scale. And um, first, I kind of want to define our terms. When we talk about scaling our systems. Um, you know, most people think about making a bigger chip with a larger connected lattice, but that's actually the second thing that you do when you're trying to scale up to larger quantum computers. The first thing you have to worry about is how do you uh, build the capacity to measure and operate more qubits? So we have this, this quantum computing center, we have a bunch of dilution refrigerators. How do we put more qubits into those fridges and then be able to connect them to our control hardware through all the signal lines that need to go down into the fridge, all the filters, all the um, all the ways we condition the lines, how do we build the control electronics to, to measure things and operate things at scale. That's actually the first thing you, got, you need to, to work on and to worry about. So to talk about that challenge, which is fascinating and diverse and full of all sorts of interesting innovations, uh, I'd like to invite up uh, my colleague Sonia Despande who, uh, and talk about some of the, the cool stuff that her team is doing to address this challenge. Thank you, Andrew, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so while, I, while our quantum ICs are already based on scalable silicon technologies, uh, these ICs are housed in cryogenic dilution fridges, along with a slew of other radio frequency hardware, which doesn't scale quite as easily. So here you're looking at a picture of what a typical open dilution fridge looks like. Uh, you can see there's a whole bunch of coaxial cables, uh, lots of microwave components, uh, and at the very bottom, which is the coldest stage of the dilution fridge, you have the quantum IC. Uh, now, as we start building bigger quantum processors, the brute force approach doesn't take us very far in the face of limited cooling power, the fixed volume that you see here, and just overwhelming complexity, complexity constraints. Uh, for each qubit on the quantum IC, you have associated substantial amount of cryogenic and room temperature hardware. So the hardware team at Rigetti Computing is investigating solutions to scale this hardware. And our main areas of focus are one, uh, the control electronics or the room temperature instrumentation that produces control signals for the qubit. Two, the interconnect system that delivers these signals to the QPU. Uh, and three, the actual packaging that holds the QPU. So in order to scale efficiently to the level of hundreds of qubits and beyond, as Andrew was speaking of, uh, our hardware must be compact in order to make the best use of the very limited space that we have in our, in our dilution fridges. All the hardware needs to be cryogenically compatible, down to 10 millikelvin, uh, and have a very low heat load on the dilution unit that cools it. Now, some of the most advanced off-the-shelf uh, RF components that are designed for use in deep space are usually rated only up to liquid nitrogen temperatures. So to put something in our dilution fridges, we often have to develop these technologies ourselves. It's also important that these components be easily manufacturable with high yields and through processes that are extremely reliable and robust. And finally, it's important that we do not compromise system performance or fidelity uh, as we integrate these scalable technologies with our QPU. Now we've made some great strides in scaling and improving our room temperature control electronics that drive the quantum processor. Uh, these instruments allow us to drive the qubits, read out signals from the qubits, tune the qubits to their optimal operating points such as the AC sweet spot that Nico mentioned, uh, and they enable us to run single and multi-qubit gates. We started out a couple of years ago uh, with standard microwave test equipment such as arbitrary waveform generators, VNAs, uh, mixers. And as we moved to the next node of our QPUs, uh, we started using off-the-shelf instrumentation such as software-defined radios, uh, precision DC sources that were customized to our measurements. But to really unlock uh, the high fidelity 99% plus gates that uh, Nico talked about, we had to move on to a highly scalable, modular, and a custom solution that we've developed in-house, uh, which is using FPGA-based control hardware. 
So the Rigetti Control Electronics Platform is designed and built to implement high-performance quantum algorithms. And we've paid careful attention to ensure that we incorporate low latency architecture to enable hybrid quantum and classical computing. The architecture is also designed to maintain phase coherence across all channels. Another feature is building in temperature stability and ease of calibration into this hardware so that every time you log into our system, you get the same expected performance. Once we generate these signals at room temperature, these signals need to go down to the QPU, and that means they have to traverse through the dilution fridge uh, from the outside world all the way down to 10 millikelvin. Now, you've probably seen pictures of quantum computers in recent press releases that look something like this. Uh, to the left, you're seeing pictures of coaxial cables that are connecting uh, the length of the dilution fridge, and to the right, you have uh, the quantum IC connected by uh, a whole bunch of coax again. Uh, these are systems at the 50 qubit level or so uh, from, some of our, from, from some of our competitors. And uh, I think it's pretty evident from these pictures that while coax cables get the job done, uh, they're messy, bulky, and clearly will not scale well to the level of hundreds of qubits. So one of the solutions that we are developing as an alternative to coax are these high density flexible circuits. These are essentially RF transmission lines that carry signals in and out of the QPU. We've designed them to be uh, highly compact assemblies with a tight pitch, miniaturized connectors, so that each of these can replace 10 or even more coax cables with a much smaller footprint. These RF circuits are developed using a custom material stack up that can hold reliably down to 10 millikelvin. And these are designed to have low electrical loss and low heat load on the dilution unit that cools them down. Uh, we can also easily incorporate integrated passive components such as attenuators on these uh, flexible circuits so that as we uh, drive the signals through the lines, we actually ensure a reduced noise photon density at the QPU. We're also doing away with most of the bulky off-the-shelf microwave components that you typically see in quantum computing systems, such as the filters that you see on the, the top left image or, or top right image over there. Uh, and we're replacing them with integrated microwave assemblies. Uh, so for instance, we, we are developing signal conditioning units that can combine the functionality of various components such as attenuators, biases, uh, filters. And in doing so, we're able to protect the qubit from channels of noise and dephasing. On the output lines, we also have integrated assemblies such as parametric amplifiers. And using these custom design integrated microwave assemblies, we can hit the optimal specs for our system and our qubit Hamiltonians. And this also buys us a lot, uh, a lot in terms of just maximizing the number of signal lines in our fridges and reducing the number of cables and interconnects. So once we start putting these technologies together, our dilution fridge looks a lot different from what you'd imagine. By drastically increasing the line density, we are able to pack a 32 qubit system in a fridge that once housed a very crowded 16 qubit system. And as you can see, there's a lot more room over there to incorporate more IO channels without having to worry about space anytime soon. In fact, we believe that we can get to the regime of about 500 qubits in our biggest fridges using this flex and integrated microwave technology. We could even imagine scaling further if we engineer our materials stack up in the flexes or develop our miniaturized connectors at these interfaces. Once the signals make their way down to the package, uh, traditionally we've adopted a packaging architecture where we route the signals from the edge of the chip through wire bonds. They land on a PCB, which is then connected to the outside world using coax cables. Now this approach has worked very well for us so far up to the Aspen scale, uh, but we're also looking at other ways instead of routing signals to the perimeter of the chip, we're routing signals vertically. And this three-dimensional approach allows us to limit the size of our chips, increase the number of line counts from the chip, and what we can do is we can leverage on a wealth of existing knowledge from the contact technologies in IC industries and 
adopt a lot of these contacts in our system. And Andrew will talk a little bit more about how we achieve these uh, through designing and fabricating our chips. Now, as we start introducing new hardware, uh, the microwave environment around our qubit changes. And this means that we need to comprehensively characterize our qubits to ensure that we get the same expected performance. We've started looking at the effect of all of this new hardware we are developing on the system level performance. And we've done this at the Aspen 7 level, uh, Aspen 7 scale chip. Uh, so here you're looking at results uh, from a chip that was measured using the Rigetti control electronics, the Rigetti flex cables, integrated microwave assemblies, and a vertical signaling architecture. And despite using a combination of these brand new technologies, we were able to measure some really promising performance. Uh, we observed state-of-the-art coherence, uh, T1s and T2s of the order of 100 microseconds. We were also able to measure extremely low crosstalk, less than 0.1%, and very promising gate fidelities, 1Q and 2Q gate fidelities, using a combination of these scalable technologies. Now, once we've proved out these scalable technologies, the next step is to integrate them with some of the high performance uh, and high fidelity schemes that Nico described. And so we believe that these hardware technologies are going to be key in enabling larger QPUs uh, that eventually pave the path to quantum advantage. <laughs>